Wood Harris. How you doing? Welcome to Vlad TV. Man, thank you for having me. Huge fan, huge fan, man. You play some of the, you know, you've been in some of the most iconic movies, you know, and TV shows mm-hmm. out there. When you talk about Paid in Full, The Wire, New yeah. Edition, new, you know, New Edition uh, biopic, um, Above the Rim. Uh, remember the Titans. Remember the Titans. Jimi Hendrix, don't forget. That's right, Jimmy. the Jimi Hendrix, uh, the first Jimi Hendrix uh, biopic. Yeah. Exactly, man. Congratulations, Thank man. You. Great success. So, so let's start in the beginning. You grew up in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago, west side of Chicago. Okay. What was Chicago like, you know, when you were growing up? Not too different than it is now. You know, um, gang, gang culture. Yeah. Um, you know, deceptive political culture. Mm. But different times, so the drug culture was different in terms of social, the social drug thing. It was kind of like the inception of crack when I was a kid. It was pre-crack, and crack changed the whole thing. And sure. You know what I mean? And, uh, but even now, the, I think the drug culture with, with all the drugs kids use so young, we were young, it just wasn't that way. You know, cats might have did something, but there's a whole world of drugs. I think it really does influence behavior quite a bit. And... Um, so my, my recollection, re- recollect, recollection of Chicago is, is just uh, friendlier than it is now, even though I think the crime rate was similar, you know, 900 deaths a year or whatever it was. Well, well when you were growing up there, because um, you have like the black disciples, the gangster disciples, mm-hmm. and then at one point you had Larry Hoover, Jeff mm-hmm. Fort, mm-hmm. Who, were, who were running that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, were you around while they were still out or were they already in jail by the time you were a kid? Uh, I think, well, I was... I was around, but I was very young, and then they went to jail. And um, there was, uh, it's like taking the head of the snake off, and now it's just a wiggly body, and it's like that now. There's no leadership even in crime. You still yeah. need, you know, um, an orchestrator above it all. So without it, you just have the young vigilantes. It's wild, it's shoot them up, and it's kind of drug-induced. So it's just, <laughs> it's kind of all bad right now. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, it's weird over the last few years, Chicago has become a bit of a, you know, Chirac and things like that, making yeah. sense out of names like that, so. Well, I know, you know, some of the some of the guys I, I interviewed in Chicago, they told me about how at one point, the projects were actually torn down. Mm-hmm. And then all the people from the projects were kind of placed, spread out, spread out and then, you know, they were used to, Selling drugs and operating a certain type of way, so they took that mentality into the, yeah. into the surrounding areas, and that Absolutely. kind of made everything worse. Definitely, I think um, once you like again, you get rid of the, the the organized crime leaders, so they're in jail. Now the the younger underlings are wild, and then the those buildings were torn down, and those areas were basically gentrified. So yeah. Cabrini Green is like. That area is now top real estate. Really? Yeah. Oh, so it Cabrini was... Cabrini Green But there was a is, plan with that. Oh, yeah. Okay. The whole city. It's kind of like what Jay-Z said about, oh, you know the projects? They meant they were projects, like experiments. Yeah. And Chicago is a red line city where even the Polish people are over here and the Italian, everyone is separated, yeah. you know? Or it was that way. It's a little more intermingled now. But when I was growing up, it was a red line city, very much so. So, you know, you would have um, different uh, Latin cultures in one neighborhood, but they would be somewhat separated. You, you know, heavy. it's a big Puerto Rican culture there and Mexican culture. Maybe, it's, I think the Mexican cu- culture is maybe a little smaller than the Puerto Rican culture there. Wouldn't you say, Mexican culture? So, um, you know, that being the case, uh, it's always been a city segregated politically. And, um, you know, uh, I think that causes certain tension, too, because there's no, there's no sense of camaraderie among people, you know. So, and we live in odd, the oddest of times nowadays, yeah. okay? So, so weird to even be doing even an interview now with the climate of American sentiment and things like that. Exactly. It's pretty, pretty bizarre, Vlad. Now, as a kid, did you ever get mixed up in any of the, any of the street stuff, or were you pretty much... Were you couldn't kid? avoid getting mixed up in the street stuff. I was blessed that, you know, I had an older brother, 
I have an older brother. People know who my older brother is, Steve Harris, yeah, and the actor. Um, the actor. And um, he took a lot of the shots, metaphorically speaking, figuratively speaking, <laughs> okay, that I may have taken. He was the proverbial big brother, you know. But you couldn't avoid the gang fear. It was it was it wasn't something that you even thought about avoiding. So it was like you step outside, you're in the world. It wasn't like there was no negotiating of it. Yeah. But I didn't have to be no no full on gangbanger or nothing like that. You know. Um, also, I'm a basketball player at the time, so right. it used to be. I don't know if it's like that anymore. But if you if you were seen to have some kind of athletic talent, cats would, who was in the, in that world, right, the drugs or gangs and stuff, they would give you a pass They'd and give be you like, a pass, no, 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 right. So I don't even know if it's like that so much. But back then, I was in that world like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that was covered up. What was that basketball documentary? Hoop maybe? Dreams. Hoop Dreams, yeah. I went to that high school. I oh, went, really? And I, and okay. Yes, and I lived in the neighborhood, that same neighborhood you see Arthur Ag mm -hmm. in. Yeah, I went to the, to the high school that Isaiah Thomas played ball for, because right. we all thought we was gonna go play basketball. And I went to the grade school, the grammar school of Isaiah Thomas. And nice. I know his family. And so we all thought, as young people, basketball was just such a, you know, just felt like you could do it, all right? Yeah. And, and music too, hip hop too. So hip hop and basketball at that time just became just life, man. Yeah, just everything. life, yeah, it was life. Even, even be above school, you know, sure. like it, it, was, it was what you built your life on, so. Now your, your dad was a bus driver mm -hmm. and your mom was a, a seamstress. Yeah. And uh, I guess an occasional substitute she did teacher. teaching and yeah, stuff Which, of that nature. Which you said in your own words adds up to no money. <laughs> I said that. You said that. <laughs> That's a fact, though. You know, you're not yeah, gonna have I mean, too much money. Yeah, you look at those money. two professions. Yeah, ain't no money coming in. And plus, yeah. my dad at the time was more, you know, from that era of of gambling and stuff. You know, mm. but the fact is, I can talk about my dad being with my dad. How many interviews have you done where the guys like, yo, so my dad, and he, so my mother and father. So the biggest thing about me and my brother probably is that. I wouldn't say we had a, nu a nuclear family, because it was too, you know, it's good times nuclear. It was too a mixture of good times and like, it was not a nuclear family, okay? But my dad was, uh, was there. He just yeah. inspired me to think I can just do anything. You know what I'm saying? So that's really my saving grace. My father's deceased now, but Rest in peace. yeah. And that, that's one of the things that I've talked about with a lot of, a lot of the people I've interviewed is that when you have these homes where you have no man in the house mm -hmm. and you're raised around women, mm -hmm. your mother, your grandmother, your aunts, and so forth, you have young boys growing up knowing the emotional side of things mm -hmm. but not knowing the, the logical masculine side of things. Mm -hmm. They grow up to be emotional men and start that's to act. That's a good point. I never thought about it that yeah. way, but that's a good point. I, I do believe you're right. I think yeah, that... I, I grew up with a father as well. Yeah. So I, I, I compare it just to some of my friends. You, right, exactly. I know exactly yeah. what you mean because all of my friends are without that. I right. have maybe one or two who literally grew up knowing their dad. You know, most of my friends weren't in the same situation that I was in. Um, but I believe you're right. I think that those formative years where the little boy is a, a non-developed gender sort of identifying person, he, he might be a male but he's going to identify with feminine things if those are the things, I think, that dominate his formative years of development. Yeah. So they might not be necessarily gay, but they end up feminized, like you said, emotional. And well, I, I don't really mean feminized so much. I mean, like, when you come into conflict, you might be overly emotional in that conflict. You mm. might react a certain type of way more of how a woman reacts, screaming, yelling, which leads to violence and so mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. And you know, in certain ways, people compare that with some of the problems of certain communities. It's like, well, the father's not around, you have men who are overly emotional that turns into bigger problems. Right, I don't know if I agree with you there, Vlad. Okay. <laughs> I think Fair that uh, there's too many different personalities of women. And um, yes, you could say that women are emotional, but- um, But a woman- All the boys are typically raised by a woman. So in every case, the primary caretaker, even if the dad is there, is a woman. A lot of times the dad is not giving you paternal 
uh, information. The maternal, maternal side is so dominant in those formative years. You know, you do need some emotion. You do have to have some emotional. So you get some of it anyway. It's necessary for you to be able to. But I, I understand what you're saying. They, they don't necessarily have um, control and they don't have uh, well, the masculine side of it. Well, well here's, here's another part. When I talk about, you know, guys who are raised without their mother is when it's time to look for a father figure, they find it from the OGs, yeah. the streets. Yeah, a lot of times. And this is who they look up to, so they start to emulate that type of behavior. Definitely. You see what I'm saying? So then now you're creating a cycle of this type of thing as well. You, you see what I I'm agree, saying? I agree, I agree. I think that, you know, it's probably something like, you know, little boy, he's around his mom, his sister, his aunt, his and her friends, and it's nothing but her, she, nothing but women, and a little boy or, or two. So, you know, he might emulate a little bit. She's switching. He's switching a little bit. She's doing stuff. He's doing it. And not thinking nothing of it. And the mother herself might not really even, oh, <laughs> she might laugh a little bit. Yeah. All right. So in the psyche of that kid, he might be like, oh, I did that? Like when he gets a little older, he may, I was doing that? He might not be um, soft even at that point, but he might just have that in his recollection, his memory. Yeah. Right? So next thing you know, I gotta toughen up. I need to toughen up. I really don't even like, like he might think to himself, I don't even like having it in my background, in my thoughts that I was, you know, at all. Yeah. So then you OG now. It's kind of like cats who sometimes it'll be a, an actor end up in a sitcom or something. You hear about these guys every so often, they, they oh, y'all think I'm soft because I'm in a sitcom? <laughs> and they might shoot up a club or something because, they, you know, whatever, I ain't soft no more, you know. Right. So. But I, I, I think I partly agree with you in terms of, yeah. I do believe that I just wouldn't cast um, every situation as that. I just wouldn't say right. that it's, I just wouldn't generalize it. women to think that, oh, they're going to give up the bursting emotion so much so that the kid will do it also. So I just think that it's, you like know, it wavers, basically. In terms of acting, because you also started rapping mm -hmm. in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Did the rapping come first or did the acting come first? Well, the rapping came first because, you know, there's no way you could act. So, um, actually, you know what, I'll change that. Because when Did I was... Did you like drama and stuff in school? No, not drama in school, but the, I would say that the first acting that I was doing as a child, I did it as a child, but it was personal stuff. Like, I think that um, I probably started to tune myself up as an artist as a young, at a young age, watching old movies and stuff. So I would look at, like, James Cagney, you know, people might have to look these names up. You know what I'm saying? Because right. they don't mind knows <laughs> these guys were incredibly popular actors. So I would look at like old black and white movies. Okay. If you don't know who these guys are, just old black and white movies with James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, and, and then go in the next room and be in the mirror like, yeah, yeah, you, you never get me, copper. You know, and just doing what they did so much. Right. And then I would do the same thing with other TV shows as a kid. Huh. So it might not be. Um, professional but it was the beginning and then I was an artist in general in terms of drawing so really yeah. artistically I started with drawing and then and now music you can go do especially hip-hop yeah. you never felt like you could be the Rolling Stones I'm not gonna be the Rolling Stones but hip-hop these guys are doing Trap Called Quest they look like these this is us yeah. we can do this what you you just had a beat where you get the beat from oh you got a break beat off a record <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, I can just sample that. Oh, that's how you did it? it? Oh, you got a beat machine, a little Casio. We had the little Casio beat machine. Yeah. Shout out my crew, man. Um, FOTM. We did shows. We opened for Special Ed back in the days. Big Daddy Kane, Queen Latifah. Um, two Live Crew. Two Live Crew. NWA, DOC. Uh, Tribe Called Quest. Right. Common Sense. Yeah. When he was Common Sense. Back when he was Common and Sense. And I did earlier shows with Tongue Twister. Yeah when he was, you know, kind of like just killing it. <laughs> yeah. Like the poor righteous teachers' messages and stuff, yeah. like not necessarily Chicago-oriented um, topics, but like, you know, you know, Black Pride stuff right. and, you know, which, th which is a genre that's not in hip-hop anymore. I think the yeah. Dead Presidents was the last group. Dead Prez, to yeah. yeah, Dead Prez, and shout out them too. I love those cats. Those are the last guys to be like, to be like that. Yeah. You know. Um, and and FOTM stood for Fruit of the Mind. <laughs> you do your work, bro. I do. FOTM, because, you know, Fruit of Islam, Chicago, you grow up with. Right, because Farrakhan, yeah, Farrakhan yeah, is Farrakhan based in Chicago. Okay, and the yeah. Nation of Islam, and 
It's a heavy political place, yeah. especially if, you, if you're paying attention, okay? You can easily uh, be in Chicago and not be in the fray of that. But if you really open your eyes a little, you're seeing Farrakhan and you're seeing <laughs> Jesse Jackson, Operation Push, and you're seeing a city that has corrupted, you know, and a state that has governors put in jail and, mm. you know, um, a powerfully corrupt place. So, you know, it made me FOTM. You know, even though I want to be Big Daddy Kane, it made me FOTM, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, the spirit of like, say, fight the power, public enemy, and stuff like that, it was really in the lyrics for me. Sure. And, uh, I'm still like that. I'm still, like I was with Dr. Dre last night. Nice. I did a song with Dr. Dre last night. You did a song with Dr. Dre a last song night. With Dr. Dre last That's night. what's up. Your first, first song ever with him? The only song ever, only song probably, ever. but yeah, I did a song with Dr. Dre last night. It's a fact, you know? Right. Um, so you're still staying with the music? Absolutely, yeah. You, okay. yeah I'm, I'm an artist. I'm just, a, I'm, just a, I'm, a, I'm like a box of crayons, man. I'm like the, um, and I'm not the big 124 box either. I'm the six crayon box. Okay. Primary colors. But if you can draw, that's all you need. That's what's You don't up. need the glitter, you know, the glitter crayons with the sparkles. and That's cool, mm -hmm. but I, I don't really need all that, so... So you're focusing on the hip hop and you're opening up for artists, mm -hmm. but the group isn't really taking off like that. Well, it was actually having some momentum. We were doing um, local things. All of that success, I just kind of, I left it because um, had I not left it, it may have, who knows? Who I knows? think it would have been successful, but um, I ended up, the neighborhood was really bad. My brother caused me to moving into the school I went and visited his school for a uh, weekend, and I was like, okay, well, I, if I don't get out of this neighborhood, I'm probably not gonna be all right. You know, it ain't too many choices. As you get older in those communities, your options become, if you haven't already made somebody yourself at 13, basically, right around, that's high school, 14, when you're freshman high school, now you're, you're moving into adulthood already. You know, huh. and you might have a single parent mom that's only 18, 20 years old than you. She's 38, you 18. You going, bro. It's time to go home. It's time to leave and get your lifestyle. So when you become a teenager, when I was growing up, 15, 16, 17, I started feeling like I needed to be able to get out. And my brother gave me um, a way, in a sense. So I auditioned for university. And that's how I ended up. I got a scholarship to, to in IU, right, Northern, Northern Illinois, Illinois University. Yeah. And then um, I continued it for the same reason. I just didn't want to be back in the, in the hood. You know what I'm saying? So I continued my, further my education by auditioning. I got into Yale. I got into NYU. Mm -hmm. And um, I chose NYU. I would have gone to Yale with Sanaa Lathan. We would have had a great class, Sanaa Lathan and um, I think Bokeem Woodbine. Okay. Um, no, no uh, not Bokeem Woodbine. Um, D.B. Uh, Woodside. <laughs> okay. D.B. Woodside, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so you went to NYU and you got your master's. I got my master's at in, NYU. In theater? In fine arts, master fine in fine arts. arts. Yeah. Okay. But it is um, predominantly in theater. Got yeah. it. So you get your master's from NYU, and at that point you d you've done a lot of plays and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had done, I had done uh, um, the way the program is set up, it's a conservatory, so you do three years and there's no, it's not like a scholastic thing where you're writing papers and things. It's really in there to fine tune you as an artist. It's not. A success in there is not predicated on grades. You, huh. if, you're not, if you're not um, evolving in talent, they put you out to school. Oh, they just kick you out? Yeah, they put you out to school, all right? And many people have gone there. Um, uh, you know, um, Jeffrey Wright went there, um, NYU. Uh, you've seen Mahershala Ali, who now is in Moonlight. And uh, uh, I forget this. There's so many of them, many talented people. So. When I auditioned for that school, you know, they take only 1% of the people, both oh, wow. of those schools, yeah, Lord. So I still felt like I was, I mean, I had so much brave naivete, as they say, because I, I just came in the scene like, I don't really care if you don't take me. It doesn't matter if you don't take me, I'm still going to be successful. There's nothing going to stop me. And I feel that way anyway, today. I don't really feel like I need to knock on someone's door and be like, you know, can you verify me? I'm in the parking lot. You know how in L.A. you got to verify? <laughs> right. You verify me, please. <laughs> I don't want to be verified. I want to just park and go inside where I got to go. <laughs> I feel yeah. you. You know, so 
um, that was just my earlier sort of young self. I just, and then I was blessed with the opportunity as a, uh, for an audition for Above the Rim. And my brother did that. Right. And that was your first film? That was my first audition. First audition? And film. Oh, so you never even auditioned for anything else? Not until before that. that. Wow. School. So fresh out of school. Fresh out of school. No, I was in school. I was, it went like this. I was, I was a freshman in school, okay? So I was, I was a freshman in grad school mm -hmm. when I got Above the Rim, the first movie. Um, it was my first audition of a professional thing, but I had, I had auditioned for school. Prior to that, I had not made any money in acting except for um, I had done a little bit of theater, uh, Shakespeare in the Park, and stuff like that. Right. Because um, you just got to be versed for real. You can't yeah. be, you know, all you could do is hood roles or whatever. So you got to be accomplished enough to do Broadway. I was able to do Broadway a couple of years ago. Yeah. I, I think if I had I not gone there, been, the challenge would have been very challenging if I was just a cinematic actor trying to do Broadway. Yeah. It requires you using your body in a different way. So, get, so I ended up with Above the Rim, but I was in school at the time. Okay, so you audition for, for Above the Rim, and you get it, and you have, it's not just an extra role, you're actually a, a, a prominent a role, role right. in the film. Mm -hmm. Tupac is in the film. That's right. I love uh, Tupac. What, what was your, you know, some of the memories of working with Tupac? Um, because he was still early in his career. He was. Right then. This he was before was. he went to jail. Well, oh, he was a big deal. Yeah, he before was, death um, row. Not a superstar at the time. Yeah. He was a star. Right. He had Brenda had a, had a baby and. He hadn't time. done even. He had only done um, the first movie. Uh, Juice. Juice. Yeah. The second movie was Above the Rim. Yeah. And so that was ninety three. Yeah. You know. So. And third movie was supposed to be Menace to Society, and it didn't work. And out. And then he punched out the. The Houston's or whatever. I got into it with, with those the Hughes, cats. Hughes brothers. What, that Hughes brothers. That yeah, that's later. what I meant. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Pac, so you're working with Tupac. What was that like? Uh, you know, man, working with Tupac at the time, when I'm looking back on it, I don't want to sensationalize it because now we have a Tupac that's iconic in this special way. But when I was working with him, he was exactly who we think he is. You know, he was um, Tupac, you know. Um, <laughs> He was, uh, his personality wasn't a wavering personality where he was different over here, over here. Now, you would see a more intimate Tupac, because Tupac was extremely intelligent. Yeah. So you could have a conversation with Tupac, and I did, about Lorraine Hansberry, that's the author of A Raisin in the Sun. Mm. Um, he was just well-read in that sense, into acting very much. And yeah, he, and he knew, had, he went to a... A high school performing arts, arts. performance, yeah. So he exactly. knew how to act he, before he was he made great. Music. He was already, and yeah. he, um, but he also you could have in depth conversations with him about Gandhi or things of that nature or black issues. And nowadays, it ain't too many of those cats you can even say one word to about something that matters. Well, right. I mean, he grew up as a Black Panther. Exactly. So he had like, you know a juice behind him that these cats don't have no more. Yeah. And, um, but I didn't know that was going to be, you, you didn't know he was going to, so, right. so at the time it wasn't like I was note, note taken here, this is Tupac did this, you know. <laughs> so you just like, I don't just feel like he's an actor, I'm an actor, and I'm a rapper. You got to remember, like I was rapping with Tupac most of the time, so my oh, fondest really? memory. Oh, so you yeah. guys were doing a little cypher? Oh, we rapped. We okay. rapped. <laughs> you know, just cypher style rapping. Yeah. So I felt like, um, a great rapper, I was, you know, you got to have bravado to be that way. So I never felt like somebody was going to be a better than me at something, you know, it just, right. you never do. <laughs> well, Not if you believe in yourself, you just really don't, you know. Well, you talked about how the way Tupac looked back then is how most rappers look today. Yeah, With he the was tattoos and the, you know what I mean? Like the, the way he It was alarming himself. too. It was alarming to see Big Thug Life. Yeah. It was just alarming. It was the first time you ever saw that. Right, yeah. Now, didn't have every stomach day. Tattoos, yeah. Well, yeah, it's nothing to see some tat on somebody's face. Right. He didn't have a tat on his face, but he had a, a lot of tats. Right. He had and, the AK 47. Um, he had the AK. Um, he had the Nefertiti. Yeah. He had the, the uh, Thug Life, of course, the Thug Life acronym. Yeah. You know, um, he big things on his back. He was he was covered yeah, he, in tats. He had the cross. He had the cross yeah. on his back, right. He was about that life yeah, already. Yeah. No one really had cross. Like, people. None of that. No one had none of that stuff. Like, the tattoos back then. Were like a white biker thing, or 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 you had a basketball right here, <laughs> right, and that's a it. Flaming basketball going yeah. through the net. And I just scored it. eighty, you know, whatever. That's it. Or a girl to have a rose, 
<laughs> right on the titty. A rose on the tip. <laughs> but yeah, Tupac. So I just remember the first time I saw that. And you know, it was shocking. I mean, literally it was shocking. It threw me back like, man, this dude covered the skin. Black people and skin is a subject. There could be a doc about black people and skin as they relate to the rest of the world. Hmm. And so early people covering it with tats, now we damn near do it the most. I think we have more issues with skin color and stuff like that than any other group on the planet. So when, a lot of times when you're seeing us with the tats, I believe that it's a little bit aggressive and I think that it's, um, it's unfortunate cats is, they look like mailboxes. Uh, you know, mailbox all written on and shit. <laughs> Cats look like mailboxes. But I get it now. I'm, I'm desensitized to it now. Now I see, I see some beauty in it too. So, um, but Tupac was also just, uh, for me, that experience just made me feel like, well, I'm a pro. So I, I felt like, well, I'm in the league. Yeah. It's the NBA now. You're on the floor. You got a ball. You right. can't. Ain't no excuse for not being able to hoop when you get on the floor. Like, you know what you gotta do to what is going on. You gotta do it, you yeah. know, so that's how I feel. And you know, I went and rewatched parts of Above the Rim and it's like, you look like you look these days. It's not like you could, you, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, the skill level back then was already there. It wasn't like, oh, I see. So yeah, you know, yeah, like definitely. for example, like you, you see early, um, like Brad Pitt movies, and you're like, he might uh, not be a seasoned. Yeah, player. it's like you know, like a, I, I, Brad Pitt. I think got by on just being pretty for a mm -hmm. long time until he and finally. And then the chops. Yeah, and then he finally got them later on in his movies. But when I watch your early stuff, it's like, oh, okay, you had it back then, and you just yeah. continued to to just yeah. kind of build on. I it. think that part of me is just that uh, back then, what I did have as an actor was a sense of listening in the scene. So that's one thing that hasn't changed for me hmm. in acting because my early training before NYU really set the road for me. And um, I had a legendary instructor and I was blessed to have just, you know, I slipped on a banana and fell on top of a legendary instructor. <laughs> you know, many times, more than once. So for me, I've been able to cultivate my talent um, organically, you know. And so back then you can probably look and see some traits you see now, because I, I try to be a real listener in the scene rather than acting like I'm listening to you. Okay, so um, I really start there. I try to separate myself as much from me, the comfort of myself, because if I'm too comfortable, I'm, I'm completely being myself. And I try to just listen to what you're giving me, because you could be giving me a myriad of things. And um, if I'm not available to it, then my eyes aren't going to actively express, you know, when the camera is in my eyes, it's not gonna express that I'm looking right at you right now. Huh. You know, it'll look like that little fake little. <laughs> I'll be saying my lines and shit. You know what I mean? I feel you. It's whack like that. It's so whack like that. So, <laughs> Above the Rim comes out, mm -hmm. does well. Mm -hmm. And then your next film is Remember the Titans, mm. where you're acting with Denzel Washington. Yeah. Did he did he have his Oscar by that time? Has, has Glory, did Glory already come out by that time? Oh, yeah. He had Oscar already. Okay. And, well, after actually, after I did Above the Rim, I went back to school. Okay. Because I was I was a freshman. Remember, the school allowed me to to take the semester off and just come back, so I could finish the program without. So I still needed that. You know, it was like I still needed the comfort and of a structure around me. That's all school did to me. It gave me structure. Otherwise, I don't think I would make it. And it's not because of the education. Part of the education gave me confidence and knowledge, but the structure gave me. Um, a settled in place to to live like I've never been an artist who waited a table I've never had a a job I've never had a job as deep that wasn't in entertainment you know yeah. um, all your money came from all my money in my life well uh, now that's not completely true okay I've had money come from uh, I mean when I was 17 I was a paper boy for 30 days right, right so that's but as an adult <laughs> I mean not a paper boy a bag Bagging groceries at 15 right. and don't really count. But as an adult, no, I've not had any other That's great. source of. But it is great. But I think what it does is makes me a better artist because I've never had to worry about. I've had structure around me, man. Like I've had a home in, in the world of in, in show business. You understand? 
because even getting into Yale gave me confidence. So when I did a movie with Tupac and them, y'all don't know what I know. You do not know what I know. Yeah. So I'm confident. Otherwise, even Denzel, even when I, there were other things before that movie. I had yeah. done The Siege, okay. it was a small role. I had done As Good As It Gets, that got Oscars. Still another small role. Super small, you guys wouldn't even, hard to find me in those roles. Okay. But that was like some, some bread, it was helping me stay on my toes, you know. Um, uh, and then I, uh, again, I met Malcolm Lee, who has gone on to do Best Man and other movies. We met in college together, and we did, I did um, his film Morningside Prep. Shout out Malcolm Lee. Um, we did Morningside Prep, and it did wonders at the Pan Am Film Fest, Pan African Film Fest, uh, Film Festival. And it, we, he got a lot of notoriety from that. It really sort of like got the wheels spinning in his career, and it did some services for me too. I was able to get agents and, and things like that based on a student film. Not even, now I did that after Above the Rim. After okay. Above the Rim, you know, because I was just serious about grinding, bro. I just didn't care, like I just wanna, I, wanna, I, want, I want this. I don't care, man, I'm not looking at nobody else. I don't care who you are, I don't care if it's the best actor. How is that the best actor? <laughs> I don't believe it, you know, yeah. I just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm probably ridiculously that way, you know. So when I got Remember the Titans, I was a bit later. Um, even Titans, yeah, Titans, um, yeah, working with Denzel was mesmerizing at first because, you know, it's Denzel. So, and it's a true story. I've been in so, I must be in mo more true stories than any actor at this point because all of them are true, even the, even the Wire. So, you know, uh, you're dealing with a real person, so I met the real person. So I'm getting this education. I got this professional, the consummate professional Denzel Washington, who any black actor has been inspired by. Sure. Right? Especially at that time. Yeah. They would be lying if they said they weren't. Okay? I mean, I mean the, would you say Denzel is the greatest living black male actor right now? No. Because I'm too competitive to say right, somebody's a yeah, better course. actor than I mean, aside from yourself. No, I'm not even saying I'm the greatest. I'm just, I, I would say Denzel is the most successful. Mm. Um, he is the most successful black actor now and probably right. for years to come, you know, right. and not just monetarily. I think he's the most successful in, a, in an accomplished career of things he wanted to do. So, and I don't think he's the most, the best actor. I just think he's at the top of the food chain and he sometimes has been the best, sometimes you know, and that's yeah. how it is. Because also the Samuel Jacksons and, you know, other great. Well, I remember for me, tit for tat at that time, it was like Lawrence Fishburne and Denzel Washington. Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne right. and Denzel Washington. <laughs> and Lawrence Fishburne has a depth in acting that Denzel, you, they, they're two different. It's almost Prince and Michael Jackson, in a sense. You know, they're, they're two different guys. Okay. You can love them both. <laughs> I can see that. You, you, you got something about one. They're different, and, but they're both at a high level. Sure. I think Fishburne went off to... He's just a different type of artist. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with both of them. Now I did, um, last year I did a piece with Fishburne called Bronzeville with Lorenz Tate and um, Mari Hardwick and uh, the Tate brothers, Lorenz and Laron Tate and Lawrence Fishburne. And uh, it's a rich cast. And um, just honored to meet some of these cats. But I do feel like uh, the best actor all the time. I never feel like I'm giving it up to, I mean, as you should. Yeah. As I do see should. great performances where I say, I wonder if I could do that. Idris in um, Mandela mm. is, uh, that's, a, that's a role that I think to myself, well, I don't know if I could do that. Um, probably I could, though. <laughs> I probably could, you know what I'm saying? Um, I just don't think that there's a role like, you know, I feel it, you. it's not like I'm, I'm, you know, saving climate, you know, I'm helping, it's acting, you know, I'm, Pretty masterful at it at this yeah. point. It's been 20 years. I'm so you do remember the Titans, mm -hmm. and then you do Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, Titans and then Hedri Hendrix. I think. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was like that. It was Titans and then Hendrix. Yeah, Jimi right. Hendrix. I mean, how, how thrilled were you to get the role of playing Jimi Hendrix in the first biopic on him? I was completely. <laughs> <I> mean, Jimmy. <laughs> but Hendrix. I was scared in a sense where I feel like, well, it's a huge opportunity. And you don't want to do a disservice to this living, I mean, this uh, iconic 
uh, legend and the yeah. people alive and his family. I met those people. And the last thing you want to do in a biopic is like a disservice to the people, you know. And so I met his dad. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's still alive. His, well, he, he's deceased now, but at, yeah, the, at time, the time he was yeah. alive. And um, like I told you, I've had many organic experiences. You know, I had Jimi Hendrix was not on the radar for me because I'm a hip hop cat. I, I wasn't really a classic rock yeah. cat like that. Now I totally, I'm, I'm all music, but at the time it was just pretty much hip hop. And uh, Jimi Hendrix opened me up as an artist and I'm very, very fortunate because I was born left-handed. Jimi Hendrix was left-handed guitar exactly, player. I was born yeah. left-handed, but raised right-handed. So to be honest with you, I feel like Jimi Hendrix experience just opened my, me up in such a way I can't really explain. I play guitar now left-handed. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I play guitar left-handed. Uh, yeah, I can get down. I can go just go do shows left-handed. <laughs> shows. That's what's left up. And I have. I went to the Viper Room. As soon as I learned the guitar, dog, I went to the Viper Room over there with, you know, yeah. famous Viper Room here right. in Los Angeles and did a whole stage Perform. show, Balls okay. Out, stage rocking with an acoustic plugged in, setting it up electric and just seeing if I could, um, what it felt like to have people watch me do that. That's all, you know. Yeah. But yeah, Jimi Hendrix changed my life. So you do Jimi Hendrix, and then you get the role for Paid in Full. I think that was it. Either that or The Wire or... I think, yeah, The Wire and Paid in Full was right around right the same time. Right around the same time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So Paid in Full, okay. yeah. So that Paid in Full. Experience. So Paid in Full was an interesting one. Because at that point, you know, when I, when I look at your filmography, Paid in Full was, was the biggest movie you were in terms of an iconic movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. Uh, Above the Rim was dope, mm -hmm. but when you look at Above the Rim versus Paid in Full, you ask kids today what they remember, everyone will say Paid in Full. Above the Rim is also Tupac. It's gonna, it's gonna right. stick so around. Right, so you, you got the Tupac, but in terms of like the film itself, right, right. I feel like Paid in Full was like, almost like the new Scarface yeah. of, that, of that era. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I do know what you mean. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because they, they even reference They even reference yeah. it. It's ironic, but it's true. So you start to put together Paid in Full. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea what it's about to do when you're working on it? No. Uh, you never really know with, with any of the pieces. You might have a gut feeling, but you don't really know it. And early on, you learn that um, these things are slowly, they grow slowly. Sometimes they take off and sometimes they don't. A film or a TV project. Like The Wire. It, it, it's the most famous thing now, but when it was out, it wasn't. So you just, I never would think that it would come to be as it is now. But um, Paid in Full happened because I knew Makai already. Makai introduced me to the story um, and was like, yo, you'd be great at this. And he gave me what I needed to as a reference. So I, the Feds magazines and all those type of mags, mm -hmm. at the time I used those as references on the story. And, and the script. And um, then I met AZ in New York. AZ Faison. I, yeah, AZ Faison, who, who is the person I portray as Ace. As Ace, exactly. Yeah, his real name is AZ, yeah. A-Z-I-E, Faison. Yep. And um, I love them, I love all those cats. They, they, they mean a lot to me, you know. Um, I, uh, I ended up getting that role largely because when I met with him, um, it just sealed the deal. It just sealed the, the deal. And um, I thought to myself, I could be this guy. When I met him, I realized I could be like this guy, you know. Um, and then it was all committed, because as an, as an artist, actor especially, you just really have to commit. And if you fail, at least you committed to it, and you weren't wavering on ideas. So when I, when I got his story, it's such a rich New York story. But Damon Dash was involved with it. Right. And I think that at the time, you know, um, a lot of the conflicts to do with the, with, with the film, progress, had to do in that world. And I wasn't privy to all the things. But I would just go on to say that I think that film may have been more critically successful if those conflicts wouldn't have been going on. I would say that there were hmm. produ production conflicts that Dame was having with Harvey Weinstein and there was just issues like that. Like and, give me an example. And of they were poorly handled. Like give me an example. Um, 
at that time, I would say that Damon was um, way more bravado. We know Damon Dash, and so I've dealt that, with Dame. Dame. Dame is a nightmare. So, well, so, <laughs> I, so could, yeah. I could relate to what you're talking. I don't about. like to throw people under, you know, nightmare. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say one it. night, I'll, I'll next say night, I, I've dealt with dream. Dame. You never know, right? Dame is a nightmare. I, I did a couple meetings. I was done. <laughs> well, okay. So, yeah, he could, back then particularly. Now, yeah. I believe he's humbled and good, you know. Yeah, I can't even imagine him back then when he was on top of the world. And oh, it was, Rockefeller it was, was it was all bad in the sense where <laughs> he just had too much control and power. Okay. Chuck or Charles Stone, who directed it, mm-hmm. was, um, had to deal with that, you know. Harvey Weinstein, they had to deal with the bravado of that personality. Me, I was submerged, immersed in the character. I wasn't really privy to how he was being. I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't looking for Damon or Jay-Z or none of them. I just wanted to satisfy the role every day. And so was Makai and Cameron had to, which Cameron, let me just say, Cameron in Paid in Full? I just watched Paid in Full the other night it was on. I hadn't seen it since then, too. Mm. I hadn't seen it since the premiere of it. Never saw it on TV, never watched it on my own. Till the other night it was on, I caught it midway. My goodness, I see why people love it so much. You know, I really do, I, I get it. And a lot of it has to do with Cameron. And yeah, me and Makai, but Cameron seals the deal. You know, it's a trifecta with him. He makes it a trifecta. A film will always yeah. be a classic, even more, it could even be bigger than Scarface in a sense. That, because nobody watched Scarface as much as they watch. You know, you ain't hearing about Scarface as much. That's our generation. Scarface! Right. I you mean, because I-, I could tell you. I don't know how many times we reported on somebody dying, and in the comments, almost every time, someone would say, "You know, dudes die every day, V." Like, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not prepared for some of the, some of the stuff. I'm just, it's way beyond the scope of my even my dreams. I'm living a life that I dreamed about, but the life is bigger than the dreams. Right. You understand at this point. I, I interviewed uh, Az Faison. Um, he said, now I, I guess even though it was his story, mm-hmm. he kind of, once he sold the story and it started to go into production, he kind of lost control of That's how it uh, goes, having you know. to say, yeah. That's how it goes, you know. He would be rare if he didn't. He's yeah. the writer. Yeah. So they don't deal with writers after, you know, on nothing, unless they're a writer-producer. You're, right. you're not going to have much to say. He, you know, in our interview, he said he had a problem with how he was portrayed wearing a wire at the end. At the end of the film, why do you make it look like I was wearing a wire and told on alpha? Which that, that never happened. Never happened, bro. So here I present a film to them, trap to try to save a generation. Like, wake up, man. Why do y'all destroy my character to the streets that who I'm trying to talk to to make it look like I was a snitch. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, he yeah. said that never happened. Okay, you know, I understand. I and I and I, I he should have a problem because it's his story. Yeah, you know, it, it's just a uh, that's just a convenient thing to do in a movie. It's just a technical, convenient way to wrap up the movie. That movie he wrote a three hundred page script. Okay. Did he mention that? AZ has written, he's a prolific writer, yeah. 300 pages. He has a 300 page version of that. That has all the gory, literally the gory detail that could never be in a rated R movie, a rated R movie. Yeah. So we had to pick and choose the elements of that story to really tell. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the film. I wish he was satisfied with every element of it, but yeah. You know, that's just how it goes. That's Hollywood. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. Jimmy Hendrix would come up and be like, "Yo, y'all messed up." <laughs> Jimmy could come out the grave and say, "Yo, B." <laughs> I feel you. He's like, "I didn't walk like that." Um, <laughs> great, great film, by the way. Thanks, man. Paid and paid in full is definitely yeah, paid full. Thank one, of my, one of my favorites, as well as most people's favorites. Yeah, I see why now. I yeah. see why now. So then you get on the wire. I'll be honest, the, the, the one thing that, that fucked with me at one point was watching an interview with uh, Idris and realizing that he's British. And I'm like, this motherfucker is not American? Like, not are, American. You, are you kidding right now? And then, and then McNulty not American. Is, is British as well. British. 
a lot of the HBO actors too, if you even to look at Empire, uh, Boardwalk Empire, huh. Al Capone, British. Oh but really? The guy who played Capone in there. It's like three or four British actors. Yeah, they're British. Yo, man, and these British guys are taking actors. all the roles, man. Trump, Trump needs to do something about the British actors, man. On, man. That's what he needs Brexit. to do. <laughs> Brexit the actors. They deserve the roles because no, I mean, they're, they're obviously they're, great they're actors. Better, not just great, they're often better because I, my theory on it is that they, they grow up with Shakespeare from day one. Right. So they grow up with um, uh, a poetry in, the, in, their, in their life that we don't. And also, black people here, in Europe, black people, um, society has a historical sensibility that associates with the African uh, contribution to Europe. So, you know, Europe wouldn't have written language and bathhouses and roads or this idea of schools and university. That's African stuff. Hmm. And Rome, Spain, and Greece, those places are African civilized places. They made civilized by the Moors who came in, in 711 in Spain and stayed there hundreds of years and they ended up with prior to that though not having numbers a sense of what a number was or written written language so um i'm saying all that to say that in european history they have that in america they pretty much don't give you the real story at all so you you're slaves and masters you see it's a big difference it makes the black americans grow up with a built-in inferiority switch hmm. that is always in the shadows if you really believe you come from slavery. There's a lot of questions to be had about all of that. Lots of black people don't come from a slave background but don't know it. We all believe we come from one giant slave. You dig? Or from some plantation. While in Europe, the European black people associate with Africa. Africa, yeah. The, we over here were we found ourselves disassociating with it. When I was young, it was bad to be, oh, you, you look African, or you, you know, those were bad things to say. Meanwhile, we didn't know, oh, my cousin was Cleopatra. Hmm. You dig? Something empowering so that the inf inferiority switch don't just turn on when you come out the house and a white cop drives by. Or you feel like you're walking through a Walgreens. Imagine. You're walking through a store that everybody walks through casually and has no sentiment at all but for what they want to buy, but you feel like they think you're going to steal. Yeah. So that is um, heartbreak, dog. I mean, our culture is pretty much a heartbroken culture with no therapy at this point. And, and um, I just think that uh, there's not a lot of compassion for, the, for, for, for that, for the... Um, the weak spots in the culture. You see the strong spots because we got the Ali and the LeBron and the Jordan and the, you see all these and you see all this bravado, but now you even see money in the young people. Jay-Z got a billion and Dr. Dre got a billion and these cats have billions, so we're not being associated with, uh, as a group, culturally speaking, black American ethnic culture group is... Um, like I said, it's pretty heartbroken and money can't fix that. And there's no therapy. It used to be church, but it's not so therapeutic because of money and things. So uh, I think that, I mean, I'm getting to this point, but I think that and it's a long road with a lot that I said, but I just think that European talent, white and black, because white people over here think masters. They think opposite of slaves. So they, they end up with a superiority uh, switch to click on hmm. you know the freedom or, or entitlement sort of thing well I'm entitled to that and it's not because you're thinking oh I'm white and I'm entitled to it you just have it in the DNA now it's just in the edifice of our own designs in the edifice of our American design energy is oozing through us to be that way I just think the European actors have early poetry of Shakespeare truthful history that's empowering and not as weakening uh, Idris is empowered by that. Um, um, all of the talents are empowered by it, white or black European talents, because they just know the truth. Yeah. They come over with more of the truth. And so with that out the way, now they got the truth. Now they can go play act better than me because hmm. I got the inferiority switch that needs to be, that needs therapy in a sense. You know, when I say I, I mean 
we, Americans, black or white, we have switches that are in the DNA that belong to a hundred years of bullshit that never got therapy or cleared up or truthfully told to us. If you don't go find your own truth in America, you will not grow up with the truth. Unless you, your dad gave it to you or your mom gave it to you. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this in some of the interviews. I remember the first time I went to Africa. I went to Senegal. And, and I wasn't born in, in this country. I was born in what used to be Russia. Now wow. it's the Ukraine. But I grew up in, in America since I was five years old. And it wasn't until I went to Africa and I started to walk around that I started to realize that there was no tension between races in Africa. And I just always assumed in my head that that was a, a, a genetic thing. People look differently, so they're going to act differently towards each other. And it, it suddenly clicked that I'm like, oh, this is an American thing. Absolutely. That this whole, you know, slavery was not that long ago. And there's still repercussions of this. But when you go to Senegal, yeah, there's, no, there's none of that. Right. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So Freedom. everyone's looking at you smiling like you're one of them. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. this is the American bullshit. I finally see it. I, I really, everyone who's listening to this really... You guys need to travel to really understand. You do need to travel where you Spend some time where you live too, yeah. Because if you just stay where you are, you're never gonna figure it out. You're never gonna figure it out. Yeah. And no one's over here to help you figure anything out, right? Or to help you get a job. Or people kill me. I said I want the president to give me a job. <laughs> well, what the fuck do you do? Right. What do you do? Yeah, everyone who, who voted you? for Trump that was broke is still gonna be broke after the, Trump. <laughs> the basket of deplorables are about to go through some deplorable shit if they don't. You know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> but it's a you. mess, dog. It's such a mess. I don't even want to go in that direction. Yeah, I, I feel you. I gotta pick up my daughter at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're on the wire, mm -hmm. and I feel like in the beginning, the wire didn't take off. You're like, right. like people knew about it, but. The acclaim started to come like way later. three, four seasons in, something like yeah, that. Yeah, way later. But when it started to take off, how did it feel? It never stopped. Yeah. Uh, well, it was after the fact for us. You know, it, it actually took off when we were pretty much done doing it. So <laughs> it, it, it was just odd. You know, it's odd for all of us. But we're an alumni now, the, the cast of The Wire, and people associated with the best show of all time. And we're just. But again, not to make this race, because I know that's just, it's not about race. But I couldn't imagine a show that critically acclaimed not having more uh, critical uh, success, uh, um, the success of awards like an Emmy or nominations. Wait, you guys had no Emmys? No Emmys. No what? No. Yo, man. Yo, bro. I, I, I'm my mind is blown right now. I, I just assumed you guys had Emmys. No. I think it was two nominations maybe in five years and it was a writer. A writer got a nomination, I think, and that was it. Maybe one other. Well, yeah, that's the way it goes. But Sex in the City got... Mm, yeah. And Sopranos... Got, Sopranos was great, though. It was. Six yeah. feet... Under, they all were great. But <laughs> but what happened to... What happened to The Wire? Oh, but that's Baltimore, so, you know. <clears throat> what happened to The Wire, yeah. You know, and, and in fact, um, I remember uh, going to meet with uh, little Melvin. Oh, yeah, wow. Who The Wire was based on mm -hmm. before he died. Mm-hmm, mm hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I got to hang out with him a little bit. That's we were crazy. Gonna, yeah, we were going to do like a little documentary piece on him. It ended up not working out. But I, I hung out with him a little bit. And and I guess The Wire was co-written by the cop that busted him or, yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah. It was there, There's a whole interesting yeah. story behind. David Simon was a newspaper journalist and writer. Yeah. He also a writer and creator of The Wire. And, um, and forgive me because my name game is really bad, but... Other people involved also were Baltimoreans who were in 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 the in the era where these things on the wire were happening, and they reported it. and And the police officers, who also were writers, ended up writers. Yeah, and stuff. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was just perfect storm. The wire. Yeah, and, and you know what, what was interesting was uh, I remember when we went out to Baltimore to go meet with Little Melvin, and you know my friend Cavario was taking me around the streets you know, in the various neighborhoods, I had never seen so many boarded up houses. You know, people call bandos now. Yeah. I had never seen, like, entire blocks were just boarded up. Like, I've never seen that much poverty yeah. widespread like, like it was in Baltimore. It was yeah. something else. Yeah, it is. I, I remember when I got the role, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to have to be in Maryland. I had never been to Maryland. Right. It sounded like it's such a beautiful place. <laughs> I was thinking, man, you know, Maryland, I look it up, 
man, crab cakes. <laughs> <laughs> you get there, yo. You like Baltimore is. I commuted. The time the time I spent shooting, I rarely lived in Baltimore because right. I felt like it was such a. In fact, I commuted, and sometimes Idris and I rode from New York or New Jersey. He would be in Jersey. I'd catch him in Jersey, and we ride to. He drove the times that we did it. Um, but we, I commuted. I stayed in basically New York, and I took the train most of the time to Baltimore to shoot the white. So, yeah. Because the city is so downtrodden at that time and so depressed that you felt like measly doing some acting assignment. You felt like you needed to do more. Mm. So. But what do you think was your greatest memory of doing The Wire? Mm. Man. You know, that's a really good question. That's funny. I've never been asked that. It's a pretty simple question. I've never been asked that before. But I have, they're just, right now, um, memories are clicking in my head. And um, I think really just, when I got The Wire is what I'm really most, because once I get a role, I like to be immersed in it, and then I forget it, you understand? I, I go in and then I, I watch it maybe once. I haven't seen all the episodes of The Wire, you understand? People know more about The Wire than I do at this point. <laughs> you know, they do, they can come and tell me stuff that I don't know, you know, and I gotta right. say, yeah, oh, well, yeah, that, that happened, yeah. And I don't even know it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because they know more than I do. I know my side of it, because I remember, Avon, but they'll know McNulty's stuff and they'll know everybody's stuff and be right. talking to characters' names that I don't even know. Because it's a rich story, The Wire. And, um, you know, um, but as far as my memory and the best memory, well, I'll tell you one. It's 1 a.m. in the morning, we're shooting, and I'm in a trailer. And we get to knock at the door time for me to go on the set. So it's me and Idris about to do it. It's a famous scene actually where they got this orange couch out there and we're walking through the projects and it's like abandoned buildings and we're walking through this, walking through this uh, empty lot basically, headed toward the orange couch. It has my, my nephew on it, D'Angelo. So anyway, uh, before they say action, I'm sitting there with Idris, we're, we're talking and we're going through the scene. We were always concerned about will the slang be proper, and we didn't have to play doctor, script doctors very much. On the wire is well written. I want people to know that Th those are the lines that were written when you see in the wire. Okay, you guys don't freestyle them. They don't freestyle a whole lot. <laughs> okay. you, know, might, you can do it. They weren't, but you didn't need to. It was just well written. Yeah. So anyway, we're going through the scene, and um, we already know what action we have to take physically. So I'm kicking this little thing in the dirt. I'm gonna kick it and shit. I look. It looked like a little rock. I kick it again, boom. So it started coming out the dirt, and it was a hip bone. A human hip bone? Human hip bone. It wasn't a cat, bro. It was wow. a human hip bone, right? Like a baby hip bone. You can tell it was a baby hip bone. So me and Driss look at each other. I don't even know if he remembers this. I never, we didn't even talk about it after that, you know. I look at him and look at him like, well, what is that? We both like, yo, is that what we think it is? And so, you know, production assistants, they touch anything. So, yo, my man, <laughs> yo, my man, come get this. So he'd come and kick that shit out. He's like, okay. <laughs> Pick that shit up. It was a bone, human bone. Clearly it was human bone. Action. Boom, that was right before action. Action, and we walking. I got, my brain is littered with this stuff. I'm walking this long walk. It's a famous scene. It's, it's this long walk till we get to the orange couch. And all I'm thinking is this. Damn, we just saw the dead baby ball. Just saw this yeah. dead. And so in The Wire, you see us in our eyes, you know. The good actors are, it, it's, you know, you see the listening in my eyes. If I'm listening to you. You see the whole story is in people's eyes. You can't see listening in the ears. Hmm. You see everything in people's eyes. That's why it's the windows to the soul. It's, it, so... In my eyes, sometimes people are getting mixed messages that work for me. Because I'm sure if you look at that scene now, you'll see so much in my eyes. But I'm really thinking about something else, and so is Idris. Idris is, when I look at that scene, I see Idris going, God damn. It's like we're saying, God damn. Y'all should have seen that shit we just seen. Like, <laughs> and then, but now I got lines I got to say when I get to a certain point. So the technical part, you have to respect that and be in tune with the technical aspect of when you're doing a scene. And it seems like the wire was such a launching pad. Definitely, you know, because Idris, Idris, Mike Williams, Michael, Michael K. Williams, Jordan, 
Uh, nearly everybody. Yeah. yeah nearly, uh, I mean, everybody. in fact, Mac Wiles. Mac Wiles. Um, who's great. Snoop. On the breaks. The breaks. We forgot about that. But go yeah. on. Uh, yeah. Snoop, Snoop is dope. Yeah. Snoop is super dope. Uh, yeah. What's her full name? Long list. Um, Snoop Pearson. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Michael K. Williams was a very interesting character because he played a gay gangster. And I guess the actual guy was in certain scenes. That he portrayed? That he portrayed. He was a big heavy set dude. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, but my man was telling me about That's this. That's crazy. Yeah. So, so, so that character, <laughs> that the gay gangster, was an actual Got real it. person. Well, Mike Williams is, is super dope. I love, I love all the dope. guys, man. I love Mike, yeah. uh, Idris. I love all those guys so much. They, to me, they're very special. I'm glad that we are, we have that history together, and and they they are extremely talented. I'm glad that I've been able to work with some marvelously talented. I just did Blade Runner with Ryan Gosling. Uh, man, it's, it's a lot going on. A lot going on. Yeah. David Simon. Mm -hmm. uh, he recently tweeted uh, using the N word. You know about that? Nah. The N-word is interesting, you know, it's one of those, as I said, switches, inferiority, superiority switches. And the N-word, unfortunately, it's a word. And, you know, it's just a switch, really. Click. Well, what had happened was, this was when Trump was running for president still. And there was a town hall about black issues. Uh -huh. And the host they got for this was... Sean Hannity. So he tweeted, my N-word, if they can get a Ta-Nehisi or a D-Ray to host, then who but you on the pulse of black America? That's just ridiculous. Um, I don't, I'm not one of those people that feels like, I don't want the weight of that word to just be around me my whole goddamn life. You know what I mean? It's been well, my you whole had, life. You had a thing when you were working on Next Day Air. Yeah, we couldn't say. We, yeah. I think we couldn't say it on the set. Yeah, I didn't come up with that. I, I, I was, was it, what, most deaf. You and most deaf, I guess. Me, were? most deaf. Um, my 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 homeboy Eni Clemens, who produced it with me. Um, yeah, I forgot who. I think it was the director Benny Boom who came up with the no N word thing. I don't really agree with that. You know, um, in the cinematic sense, you you got to say what you got to say, but. Yeah, you won't hear that word in that movie, which is kind of cool at this point. I'm not, that's a distraction, man. You know, oh, it's the N-word. Oh my God, who said it? Who said it? I'm hurt. You know what I'm saying? Either fight, but it, it, either it's a fight or a dance. So if you come in the dance, then I ain't no dancer. Me personally, would have. I'm not a dancer. So I'm a fighter more than anything. I fight for roles, I fight for my culture. I'm just a fighter. I think that the N-word coming from David Simon, it don't mean nothing to me. I don't care. I don't care about that. I'm more concerned about Trump and Sean Hannity and the people that Trump puts in office who affect uh, our lives moving forward. It, you yeah. Know. I mean, it's just such a, it's the most loaded word it in is the loaded. English language. It is loaded. It, like, in, like in, you know in what I'm America. saying? Because <clears throat> when, when you, you know, like for example, I, I never say it, mm -hmm. ever. If I'm quoting a, a song, I'll just skip that word. Right. Or if right, I right. have to say it, I'll say the N word. Right. Right. Because it, it's one of those things where if a if a white person, a black person, gets into an argument, it almost seems like the white person has that that card they mm -hmm. can pull out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If they're losing the argument, they could pull that out. Yeah. And, and and get a reaction. Yeah, and get a reaction at bare at bare minimum. Because you I said it's like a switch. But yeah. nowadays, younger we listen, the younger generation, they don't give a shit about that. You think? You think Lil Yachty care if somebody say the N word? You think these young cats care about that? They don't. Well, now, not all of them. Not all of them are that way. It's just that it's been seduced into culture so much. You hear all different cultures say, yo, you say the N word to each other. Right. Puerto Ricans use it. Yeah, Puerto Ricans. Asians use it. Hip hop people use it. Hip hop. White people use it. They, it's just in the hip hop, it's part of the words. That, it's, it's a word that means so many different things, and, and none of it's necessarily all that good, but you know, you, it could be a word of, you can have an endearing way to use it or, you know, it's a word, it's a word, man. I'm, I'm just sick of the weight of it. I'm sick of the weight of it, because it's just a switch. Click, did I bother you yet? Hmm. Nah, you ain't fucking bother me. So that dance is over, so like, now let's fight, because that's a dance. Yeah. Nigger, 
okay, they go to dance part, but here come the fight. Cause you know, it, it's, it's, black culture is full of, we have the greatest metaphor, boxers. You know, we have an army of those guys. It's an army of Ali's and Mayweather's and Tyson's in the black culture, in the hood. Now they're not really here anymore because I think that we, we they're, they're, they, they aren't, um, there's not been nutrient support of them. Um, people who can be fighters for the culture aren't there anymore. There's no Tupac voice. There's right. no hip hop doing it. Hip hop don't do shit. I mean, you see a little bit of it. You see Kendrick. You see. J. I love Cole. Kendrick, and he's the only. And he, those two. Yeah. Come to mind for sure. He actually was in my mind when I said it. <laughs> yeah, because he is, and he is young. So I, you know. Yeah. That's why I said, well, little Yachty, and then I kind of yeah, right away I thought, well, Kendrick Lamar is a person with that sentiment. But it take it take a lot, man, for things to right. Happen. Because I mean, when we were younger. Conscious hip hop was the dominant part of hip hop. Yeah, definitely. Like Public Enemy at one point was considered number the hottest one. shit. That was the number one. Period. It didn't matter if you were white, black, Asian, yeah. Spanish, you loved yeah. Public Enemy. Yeah. Even if what they were saying you couldn't exactly relate Which to. Which is bizarre, actually, if you really think about it. The success they had is is I can't see another group doing that. I it didn't happen it was, with uh, X Clan, didn't happen with Dead Press. I think it was the the Bomb Squad, the production. The production was so good, you know. And then you know you had the voice, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the Chuck D with but the, right, with the, the bomb flavor flave. But then the Bomb Squad, the, you know, I mean, to the point where I thought Ice Cube's best album was America's Most Wanted, which is all the Bomb Squad. You know, I mean, matter of fact, I remember when I interviewed Russell Russell Simmons, he told me that the Bomb Squad saved Def Jam. Wow. He said that that production, like at that time, Def Jam was in trouble. You know, they didn't really have a lot well, you of... You couldn't have a bomb squad today. It'd cost a lot of money. Because in one the song, samples, they had 15 yeah. samples. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was the golden era where you got away with you all got that away with stuff shit. before yeah, the when, biz. Yeah, when Beastie Boys lawsuit. did Paul's Boutique and had like 700... Right, yeah. samples like, <laughs> like per song. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, th that, that's what it was. Um, but yeah, you, you don't see... It's not as ubiquitous mm -hmm. today. You just mm -hmm. have the, the, spr the sprinklings. Of, Light sprinkles. Yeah. You were just in the new edition biopic, um, which you know we were talking about this before. People put it in terms of made-for-TV biopics. Mm -hmm. It's a toss-up between the new edition biopic and the the Jackson Five. Why well, I see the Jackson Five? Uh, I would just say new edition. Right. Would probably be number one. Yeah. Because I can't imagine it, something being as uh, accomplished is that across the board directing cinematically uh the story itself told by you know i don't know if the jackson five was told by the jackson five and produced by the jackson five with michael jackson they, they were involved in it i'm not sure if they were as involved as well this is all of new edition yeah and brooke Payne, really which is who you who i portray in in, in on the, on the, yeah. in the movie but um this is them and i love those guys very much um and this is them certifying the authenticity of it, measuring up the truth and, you know. Not really sugarcoating it. Not sugarcoating you know, it. You saw the real. drug use with Bobby Brown and, you saw every, and, and Ricky. You saw, every, you saw you know, them Ricky go through Bell. what we could show in the three nights, you know. And yeah. I, I don't think it's a better biopic. Um, I, it's better than even some of the biopics that come out in the theater. Like, uh, I would see this over even a musical biopic like The Doors. And that was well accomplished right. by Oliver Stone. Right. You know, it's interesting because yesterday uh, I'd interviewed uh, Tyron Turner. Oh, wow. You know, and, you know, he's best friends with Jamie Foxx. We were talking about Ray. I guess Ray originally was a TV movie. When he did Ray, did you know that it was going to be as big as it was? Nah, nobody knew it was. We, it was a, it's, I think it was supposed to be. Ray Charles, a pretty big yeah, musical but we, figure. No, nobody knew. We thought, I, th I think it was made for TV at first. Oh, really? Yeah, it wasn't supposed to go theatrically. Would you say it's up there with, like, the Rays and the What's Love Got to Do With It? And More like that. You know, I think that it's probably, first of all, six hours. Yeah. Right. But so it's, six it's hours, but 40 minutes. Cut off of them. From each hour, so that's... Hour 20. Yeah. So it's, it's six, three, it's, it's, what's that? Wait, wait, 240, no, two hours. Yeah, it's two hours. Two hours altogether. So it's kind of like a movie. 
It's longer than two hours altogether. Every night, how many? How, how long do they play every night? Well, it's an, it's an hour each night, but only 40 minutes of that after commercials. Oh, right? I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My fault, my fault, my fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 120, 120 minutes, two hours. Yeah. Was it only an hour long every yeah. night? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Wasn't it? I thought it was longer than that. Yeah. Well, no, it's... Okay, I thought I, it was I, two wait, hours. Am I, am I messing up here? No, wait, it was two hours each night? Yeah. Is that what it is? Okay, maybe. maybe that, that's what I'm saying. It's okay, longer yeah, than yeah. a regular movie. It's longer than, yeah, so you had more but, time to tell the story. Yeah, a little bit more time in three days, and you know, uh, so it's different than those things. That's that's just like those movies are straightforward, and um, I just think it's accomplished. You know, in, it's an accomplished story. I think the actors are a couple of perfect storms happened, and so I, I think it, it's high up on the list. You know, um, of biopics. Yeah, I think yeah. it was cast very well. Yeah, Robbie Reed did the casting. She's an extraordinary person. Yeah, Ralph Tresvant nailed it. Everyone says that. Someone yeah. said that to me earlier. Ra- yeah. Ralph, you know, and then like Bobby Brown as a kid really nailed it. Like the kids, you know, the fact that they showed the them. kids and the, That's you know, incredible. The, the, Wait, the, the fact the, that they showed, the, this is what makes it the best biopic, maybe to date, okay? Uh, I don't know if I can name one better, especially with music in it, okay? The kids, and then when they turned adult, you didn't lose any quality of story. You right. didn't, the kids were great. They weren't just good. They were great. And they kept you captivated. And so did the older ones. Nah, man. You know, if you got a big group. Okay, Wu-Tang got a lot of rappers in it. Some of them cats ain't that good, bro. Because <laughs> the group is so big, you're going to have a variance of talent levels. So in the N.E. movie, it's not, it's not, people might love me and they're familiar with me, but really there's not a great variant of talent. People are, it's just a high level of talent across the board. And including the director and um, and BET, sh- kudos to them for going all the way with it. And I think it's an extreme success for them, and I love them for that too, you know? Yeah, great, great project. Thank great you, pro- and, and, you know, you forget how good the music is. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, we were talking about this, when you guys, well, you weren't in the scene, but when they redid the, you know, Can You Stay in the Rain, that scene in the studio where they're laying it down with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, it was like, wow. <laughs> like, this is so well done. I went back and That looked the, like Jimmy, that literally looked like. I had to ask my assistant, I'm like, is that? Is that them? Like, no, exactly, no, I look like them. They're actually going to get them. Yeah, because they, they nailed it with the suits and everything. Just like them. I went back and watched the music video for Can You Stand the Rain, and I did not like it as much as <laughs> the biopic version of it. it was actually, you know what I saw, too? On Facebook, I saw... Somebody, I'm not sure if it was Instagram or Facebook, but they had the actual 25th anniversary uh, that you see at the end of the movie. Yeah. All the dancing and singing new edition. They had the actual new edition and then the acting, the new edition movie version. Yeah. And they had them side to, I mean, next to each other. Man, I could, they did such a great job. They're like the younger version of, they're better than New Edition is now, in a sense, they're like the young New Edition. Like right. And they actually sing themselves, because we had put up an a cappella version of them doing, of the cast. Oh, that, doing, let, me, let me say that. Let me make that clear. Because I do believe a disservice was done in that, yeah, the kids all sang. This is the little kids sang the songs. Yeah. The big kids sang the songs. Yeah. They should be putting that into marketing. People don't even know, Vlad, that. They don't. That. This little kid, Jai, who played the young Ralph Tresvant, just these kids are the future. They're unbelievable. I love them so much. You know, I, I just love them. But they sang it all. They 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 were the consummate professionals, you know, they were hungry and alive for everything, full of zest and zeal for the performance. And a lot of these kids, it matters to them. The hunger is there because it matters. Yeah. And you don't want to be pacified by your success. Some people do. They get pacified. I'm successful already. I'm doing this. I'm doing no, yeah, nah. nah, I wake up and feel like I ain't doing nothing yet. I've done nothing yet. Yeah. So you can really like have that fuel behind what you do. How involved was New Edition day to day? They were there on the set every day. Every day. Some members of New Edition were there every day. Right. Including Bobby, uh, Ralph, uh, Ricky, Ronnie. Yo, they were there, dog. Were I there. love them. Yo, I love them. I want y'all to know I love New Edition, you know. I'm saying their names and it's like, yeah, they were there, you know. Right. And, you know, I did a poll on the greatest R&B groups of all time. And, uh, you know, it was like New Edition, Jodeci, 
TLC, Boys to Men, New Edition One, because I think that you know there's the newness of it, but it just shows you, you forget how how significant of a group they they are. Yeah. Well, just remember this part in the movie too. A dollar eighty seven to split with the band. Yeah. Cat's got thirty cents. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, right? It's kind of fucking, but but really think about the level of, man, that's, they ain't even get a group 50 bucks. Yeah. To, they ain't getting $10 a piece. Yeah. That's how dirty the music industry yeah, and they was and is. Number one songs. Number Tour, one songs sold out all numbers. over the world, yeah. buck 87. And how ironic, well, I'm hollering 187. <laughs> right, that number. Because they yeah. killed him with that. They gave him 187. They split that and all got 33 cents a piece. <laughs> It's crazy, dog. Like, yeah. yeah. And that's man. true. It's true. And it's authentic because, you know, they were there to testify to it. And they were there to give us the truth of the story, you know. Right. You know, and I, I've been hearing about Maurice Starr and everything else like that for years. It was, it was cool I to actually I got to meet him. It. I got to meet people. You oh, know. oh, the real Maurice Starr showed up? <laughs> really? <laughs> On the set. Yeah? Yeah, one day in the crowd. Yeah. Oh. oh, so he wasn't invited? No, I'm sure he was... I'm not sure if he was invited. They wouldn't turn him away, though. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, he, he, he's, a, he's, he's who he is, you know. It right. wasn't a problem, but he was just he, in the he, audience. He went on to start, what, New Kids on the Block? I he think. did do New Kids on the Block. Yeah, so he, he's rich. Yeah, he is. <laughs> Bloody rich. Got an ascot on and everything. Oh, really? <laughs> he had a pendant on an ascot. That's was a he, rich mom. So did he actually see his, his role get he did. played out? He saw that with the hair and all. The, uh, Jerry Curl, yeah. Yeah, he saw all of that. And he, yeah, so the people were there, you know, you Crazy. can't, you just can't, yeah, yeah that's the best biopic. Um, I can't think of another, be- you know, yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be involved with that. Absolutely. Uh, all these things are some of the best. That's why people, I feel like I, I have a longevity in, in the career and an indelible place because I'm so lucky in a sense that the wire is the best, that anything is, uh, things I'm getting involved in keep a folklore. And um, and I'm associated with it, so it, it just keeps me a, a shining star in a sense. You know, it's pretty pretty awesome. Coming from Chicago, being being a rapper, at one point uh, you had some words about Chief Keef. Oh yeah. And the effect of oh, Chief Keef. Okay. So let me let, let me read this to you. Uh, what did I say? Shit. You said uh, we have to be very careful not to let the artist get dumbed down because the artist will be the missionary the message holder, and the activist. But now people get famous doing something silly on TV and they run with that ball. I'm an artist, I'm not insulting NeNe Leakes, but I think more than half of television is reality TV now. I'm friends with most deaf, we wanna talk about something. Uh, That's what's gone when Tupac is gone. There's nobody who says, dear mama, there's nobody with his complexity as an artist. I love Lupe, that's my brother, my Chai Town brother, but he's retiring. And he was retiring before the Chief Keef situation. And that Chief Keef situation is extremely sad. Now they could sell sad. Interscope is selling sad. I don't care what the lyrics say. I don't care for it. Man, whoever said that, that dude talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that guy says some deep shit. Like, oh, man. Um, Intersc- Interscope was selling sad. Yeah, I guess that's true. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't really have nothing to say about Chief Keith, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, I think he's locked up now or something as he's, we speak. He's out on bail. Oh, he's out on bail. Okay, yeah. And uh, I wish him the best, to be honest with you, man. I, it's tough enough as it is, bro. It's tough being that dude. I don't know what he's been through in his life. But when you're seeing people do stuff, man, you're seeing them come from a place of pain a lot of times. And I'm a little more compassionate for people. I just, I'm very rare to throw somebody under the bus and... Um, I just wish Chief Keith the best with his family and stuff because he has some golden opportunities and he don't have them anymore. So I wish him he the best. He still has a lot of opportunities. People still fuck with Chief Keith. Like yeah. He, he still has a real, a real fan base, like a real like cult following. Because if you really think about it. But you got to have promoters <coughs> who. Well, he's not, he's not on Interscope anymore. He, he's independent. Yeah, who's going to. Listen, if people think the place is going to burn down, how are you going to get shows? If people, you're going to shoot up the club. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Yeah. I, he got to go to Chicago and do can Will he go to Chicago and do a show? Probably not. I don't think he's done a show. What about out here with the gangs? You think he can go uh, I mean, have he a tours cool around, he, he tours around and does and does stuff. I don't know um, what the, what's going on with well, that. Well, Chief Keefe really set the stage for musically 
where Chicago is at right now. Like you're talking about drill music, you talk about gang music, you talk about that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's been around for a while, but he, he when he did it, it set off a whole he did. He chain did. of he events. Did. When you see the Dirks, when you see you know, um, when you see I got a lot of respect from the King like Louis. You see a lot of people that may may have even been doing it before him, but when he did it, it got to such a high level that it created a whole marketplace. A scene, for him. Right, yeah, it created right, a scene. Right, right. You know, and the chance the rapper is considered such an anomaly that he's from Chicago, but he's not doing drill. He's not doing drill at all. You well, see what I I'm think saying? the drill is, is is no pun intended, but dying, right? Isn't drill well, dead? It's, it's gangster music. It's no gangster how you, music. That's like saying, well, trap is dead. Trap's always been around. You know, they just, you know, you could say that's true. N- NWA that's true. is trap. You know what I mean? That's true. I never even thought it from yeah. that. That is true. That yeah, is true. I, I, that's I've true. always, you know. No, that's a fact. That's a fact. Um, Man, you know, I just, uh, I just wish the music, um, I wish I liked it more. I'm glad the people like it who like it, because I still got what I like, and I can go listen to it, you know what I'm saying? But I wish I liked the stuff more. I wish it wasn't everything grew on me and shit. Now I like it, because, you know, I heard that shit, how many times you gotta hear it? 10,000 times or whatever. I heard it 10 times, now I like it. I'm kind of sick of that. I remember, you know, you, you had a thirst and a liking for an artist, you went and got it, Rock him or whoever you put that on, and you was like, whoa! And the next artist you got was you and they were different. They intended on being different. They yep. were original. And you got it, you were, oh, and it was inspiring. Now, I sit when I get pick up my daughter, I sit in the car and I'm like, who you think they're gonna have on the radio? We have a we have a who they gonna play now before I turn the radio on, tell me who's playing. And she'd be like, Jeremiah? <laughs> I love that song. I love those songs. Yeah, but Jeremiah's dope. Jeremiah's super dope. Another yeah. Chicagoan. Another oh, Chicagoan. Oh, he's from Chicago. You're right. Another Chi-town. You keep forgetting he's about that. He's super dope yeah. and independent. No, uh, is he independent? He was on Def he Jam. He was independent, right? He was messing with 50, I think. He was on, De- he was on Def Jam. Oh, he's on Def Jam right now? Might be the case. He was when I originally met him. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. What do you think of Trump and what, what he's been doing in the first, you know, in the honeymoon phase of his, uh, of his presidency? Uh... It just feels bad, you know, it, it feels bad, literally, like, uh, I was saying it's more like the divided states of America, in a sense, uh, because that's what we realized. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a big petition for California to secede <laughs> from, from the United States. I think it's gotten, like, hundreds of thousands of votes. It's that, it's that bad. I mean, it's not going to happen, but what I'm saying... What do you think about it? I just think it's so toxic that... All I can feel is bad. I actually am at a place now where I feel like ignoring it, but you can't. You have to be active, but I'm so sick of the power he's been given. I can't believe how many pussy-ass politicians there are who just let anybody do what they want. And and this guy, Barack Obama, had to throw, he didn't have to do it. I wish he wouldn't have done it, but he threw Reverend Wright. Remember he threw Reverend Wright under the bus? Right. Because the guy said not... God bless America, but goddamn America, and they cut that and looped that, and they took it out the context of the speech and all that. Well, this guy gets in there and literally does whatever and says, and whatever the fuck he wants, and he has the most power of any president. Now check that out. Seemed like a pretty bad place to me. Now here's what you do, Vlad. Here's what people are gonna do, more so than ever. Start counting their money and separating themselves from whatever you whatever you're talking about is American values. People, in, I'm in the 1%, so yeah. I can sit back and be like, I can't afford to do it because, like I said, my culture is, you know, I'm there, I'm, I'm the cultural person, you know. I don't feel like I can afford to look away in a sense, but I feel like it, bro, because it's so fucking messy. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like I'm just, I feel like everyone is just idling, well, I mean, just I, I percolating. Can't, I can't tell you something, you know, because, you know, running my website, I see what reacts and what doesn't. And up until now, politics never really reacted mm. with my audience. And wow. I have a mostly African-American, wow. you know, 18 to 35 audience. But now, when we put up stuff about Trump and what he's doing, it's a huge reaction every time. And I feel like, I think like people realized that, that they fucked up by allowing, by, by. You think? Well, I think. Who are the people? The basket of deplorables? Because. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, because. Me and Scarface got into a long talk oh, okay. the, the other day about this. And he said, you know, you know, black people didn't have a dog in the fight. 
when it came to the election because the Clintons put more black people in prison than any other president. That's a good point. So there was a certain level of, I'm not going to vote, I'm not, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? Like, lesser two evils, I just will just sit out this race, mm -hmm. which allowed Trump to come in and just sweep everything up. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, it's and confounded anyway. I mean, he didn't even win the popular vote. Yeah. It's just, it's such a mess, Vlad. It's, it's such a tremendous mess that all we can do is talk about it from a real far place. You know, we, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen. I'm very disappointed about who he's putting around him. Yeah. He's bad enough, but to put worse people around him who really don't have, and there's a war on women too. Like, yeah, you can say black people and, and Mexicans and walls and all this and Muslim problems, but the women too, man. Like, they're getting rid of the abortion and they're telling women they can't have their bodies. And, yeah. and uh, it's a scary, scary, it, to me, it's, it's, it's the scariest it's ever been. This country is the scariest it's ever been in my lifetime because it feels like we're um, budding into maybe a, a bit of a civil war-like issue, like a civil civility as at risk. Police are more militant than ever. I never felt the way I feel now about the blue, you know, blue lives matter, right? So I never felt, uh, think about that now, Vlad. Um, he said he's the law and order, right, uh, uh, president. Today he had this little pandering thing with these black people. He had Omarosa, yeah, it was on TV Live. Yeah. And he had Ben Carson, Omarosa, and these other black people who don't belong um, to my culture, really. I don't know where they come from. But, um, yeah, he pat, pat Ben Carson on the back and let him be responsible for HUD, which is How black people, right. brown people, poor people, you know, Section 8 people. Yeah, and this who is someone who... Was a doctor. He, ha he has no notion of right. how to govern anything. He said whatsoever. he doesn't believe that there's racism. He, you know, feels that poor people is their own fault and stuff like that. Listen, the best thing about Trump is that it's four-year to eight-year gig. The mistakes he's doing now make it difficult for it to be an eight-year gig. The more he does things that people are so adverse to, it, it'd be difficult. Uh, the Democrats, they suck. He, like, like Scarface said, they suck ass. Um, all of that political shit, they all suck because they have um, personal agendas and they're acting like they, 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 they're here for American people and there's no, there's none of that. Really, they have personal agendas. Everyone's a billionaire in the cabinet. Can we be? Yeah. And, and he's actually, you know, we ran a story about this. He's the most unpopular president of all time in a record eight days. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sad, man. It's sad. Uh, wow. Wow. You know, I'm hoping he gets impeached at some point. I'm hoping that he, he pushes the line so far that he crosses it to the point where... He might, and I don't... But he's so ballsy and so powerful. Why would they want to give that much power to an individual? I, who, like, people are scared to even say they don't like him. Yeah. Like, I've never, I've never been in a situation like this before where... I mean, because this is the pettiest person... Petty. Who's ever been in he's this gonna, position? If I could say, I could say something about him, and he might tweet it about it. Right, right. He's, he's, you know, in terms of Twitter fingers, Meek Mill ain't got nothing on man, him. Man, he got Trump. Twitter <laughs> fingers. Man, <laughs> Twitter fingers. Or I, I, yeah, man. I needless to say, I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. I'm, I wasn't into Hillary Clinton. Um, I like Bernie Sanders. Yeah. I still think that he, if he's in good health in four years, we might see him again. Hopefully. I don't like the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or any of the parties. They're like gangs. You pick a gang or whatever. Yeah. And so I'm not, none of those gangs, they're not my gangs. But I will say that the Democratic Party is very disappointing because they proved to be, what's that, eunuchs? Ballless, dickless things walking right. around in suits. Because they're so focused on re-election. Yeah, focus on re-elections and um, also pan and catering to their corporate interests. 
So when they're not focused on re-election, because they need to get re-elected so they can keep that corporate interest with a home. Right, well, so, keep the money coming yeah. so they can get re-elected, because yeah. it's expensive to get re-elected. Congress people work six months out of the year. They work four days a week. They make $160,000 a year, Congress people. That's what they make from their pay. They work six months, okay? They get every Friday off. They, uh, they work uh, part-time, it's part-time work, yeah. essentially. They make 160000 which ain't a lot of money. So now you come and offer, if you work for a company that's toxic food or whatever, or, or, or a drug that you need passed before it's legitimate. Yes. It's got a million side effects. I'll just tell the world about the side effects. Can right. you get this on the market? Okay, I'll get it on the market. What you got for me? Well, you make, you're making $160,000 a year. Let me give you 500 stacks. Yeah. It's a done deal. Right. O on top of it, and this, was, this was covered on 60 Minutes. It, is con it was considered totally legal. So let's just say you're, there's a bill that's coming up, and you know that this bill will have an effect on a certain stock, mm -hmm. right? Once this passes, this stock is going to go up or go down. You're allowed to buy or sell that stock before right. that bill passes. 60 Minutes did a special about it. They changed the rules, but they still allow the family members <laughs> to do this, even though the actual politicians themselves can't do it. It was, it was one of those things. So the, the amount of money a, a real politician makes has nothing to do with their salary. There are so many other oh, yeah. they, streams they, of income that they make. Oh, it's insane. This is why people become career politicians. And if you look at the founding fathers, this is why you have the six months out of the year, the Fridays off. They never intended politicians to be full-time jobs. They're, these are supposed to be citizens who have other jobs. They're not supposed to be life, lifetime politicians. Fail. Clearly didn't work Fail. out. Fail. Yeah. <laughs>